once we diffuse the conflict and once you're owning your own stuff, once you're recognizing your own patterns, once you're saying to your partner or your colleague or your child, once you're saying, yeah, that's something that I'm continuing to work on. I got to own that. Yep. I was doing that thing. It's an enormously connecting experience. Welcome to season six of Fluster Clucks with Lynn Lyons, where we talk about a family's anxiety and all the big feelings too. We tackle the serious stuff without being too serious. And I'm your co-host, Robin. I'm Lynn's sister-in-law, and I'm here to ask your questions. And I'm Lynn Lyons. I'm an anxiety expert, speaker, mom, and author. And I've been a therapist for over 30 years. Parenting can be a Fluster Clucks, and I'm here to help you find your way. I'll give you concrete steps to take and the words to say. Okay, Robin, I have to tell you what happened to me last night. Okay. You know how I talk about my worry part and her name is Edith Ethel and she like smokes camels. And the thing she always says is like, you're going to drop the ball. You're not going to show up. Like, and I fear like I'll be sitting on my couch and then somebody will call and be like, you're supposed to be in Chicago. Where are you? (laughs) Guess what happened last night? You were supposed to be in Chicago. I wasn't supposed to be in Chicago, but I wasn't supposed to be in my living room. It's not as horrible as I totally forgot, but- I thought I was supposed to be at event at 7 p.m. And we were getting ready to leave the house to drive south. And the phone rings and they say very nicely on the phone, hey, we're just wondering, like, do you need some directions or how to get here? And I pick up the phone. I go like, hey, hi, no, we know where we're going. And they're like, well, why aren't you here? I thought the event started at 7 and it started at (gasps) 5. And they were calling me at 5 of 5 wondering where the F I was. Uh Uh-oh. Yeah. You know, I talk about an overestimation of the problem and an underestimation of your resources to handle it. I had about 15 seconds of, oh my God. But the happy news is we got back in balance. It wasn't an emergency. We upped our resources. And thank goodness this school where luckily they know me, I've done work for them before. They were like, all right, we're going to put you on Zoom. We're going to set it up. We've got an auditorium full of people. We're setting it up. We're going to bring you onto the big screen. And we actually made it happen in 15 minutes. But I was in my kitchen with literally with curlers in my hair. And they called and said, where are you? Wow. Has that ever happened before? No. I mean, I've been late to things like there was once there was a snowstorm. And so they were waiting for me and the roads were really bad on 95. This was when I was driving myself. So I've been late before. There was another time where my husband was driving me and we were trying to find this school that was in the middle of nowhere and we couldn't find it. And so we were probably like 15 minutes late and we were calling them and telling them we were coming. I mean, I've forgotten clients for sure. Like I remember walking into my waiting room once I'd just gotten back from the gym and there's a person sitting in there, but I have never completely screwed up in this way. Well, you didn't actually screw it up because there was a solution. Yeah. I mean, but there was a problem that required a solution. Anyway, they were very nice and we were all flexible spaghetti, but yeah, it was very, very anxiety provoking. I'm just telling you. I'm sure it was. It's the classic nightmare that you have an exam that you didn't know about. Correct. I mean, I joke all the time that my fear is the phone will ring. Where are you? And last night the phone rang and they were like, where are you? Anyway, I've got that out of the way. So now good. I don't have to worry about it anymore because it happened. And we handled it. It is so interesting how common themes of anxiety dreams are so clever. Mine have always been you show up for an exam that you didn't know you had. I often have one where I don't know if I'm the only one who has this. I have one where it's like, oh, I still have a lease on an apartment (laughs) in New York City. I haven't been paying rent for the last like 20 years (laughs) and I have a big bill. All right. We're going to dive into a topic today that you and I were talking about and I think is pretty relevant to most people. Families. Yeah. Who are in relationships with other people, which includes most people. Yeah. So your brother, who's my husband, we were having a conversation about a couple that we know that may go through a divorce. If we'd had that conversation in our early stages of marriage and before we had done any of this kind of work in the podcast, We would have probably talked about, oh, well, that's two people choosing the wrong people. They weren't a fit. But I 
said to my husband, like, I see this very differently now where every couple sort of has an equal chance regardless of what they have in common and what their obstacles are as long as they are focused on this work of emotional management. But I don't think most couples are. You'll see this interview where there'll be some article and they talk to people who've been married for over 70 years. And they say like, what's the secret to having your marriage last 60 or 70 years or 50 years? And nobody ever says, oh, well, we really got along perfectly all the time or we had everything in common. They'll say things like we were constantly working on and communicating with each other or we figured out how to work through problems. There's this element of it that you're constantly working on the relationship and trying to figure out, and I think this is what we're really going to talk about, trying to figure out what your own patterns are and owning them and then making those adjustments along the way. It's interesting you say that because when I have seen those types of interviews, I feel like the answers are actually always one of two, and I don't think they're accurate. There's always the jokey answer where if it's a man and a woman, the man's like, well, I've learned to just say my wife is always right, Yeah, which is really annoying. And then the second one I often hear, though, which is a little closer to the truth, there's a, an even temperament that they recognize as essential to weather the storm of life. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. I mean, I've definitely heard this sort of like what my friend calls old man humor, like, well, I've learned that I can be right or I can be wrong, but it's better if I'm always wrong, you know, and I'm like, ha, ha, ha. yeah, how's your ball and chain? Yada, yada, yada. Don Rickles humor. Right. Don Rickles humor. Yeah. Some people are listening. They're like, who's Don Rickles? Who's Don Rickles? <laughs> he was an old ball guy. And it was all about sort of the long suffering husband. Blah. I definitely hear when I read those interviews that we've learned how to navigate problems, like that we've gone through tough places or we've really had some tough times. And implicit in that, it seems to me, is that we figured out how to navigate when things aren't going well and we've stuck with it. I mean, those are all very vague terms. Well, if you think of it a different way, what couple doesn't face really big obstacles over the course of a relationship with raising children, caring for parents, dealing with financial stresses of supporting a family? Like every couple will face what they face. But when stressful moments happen, what patterns show up? And how are they handled where they create greater, okay, we're a team and we're going to get through this, or the patterns unfortunately can do the opposite and drive a wedge between the couple. After we take a break, I really like the list that you came up with of some of the most toxic patterns that couples have. So let's get to that. Okay. Okay, Robin, I'm just going to share with you a fantasy of mine. I have always wanted a shoe that I could travel in and then go on stage and present to parents wearing the shoe and then even wear it for a workout. I didn't think this was possible, but I think I may have found the answer. Well, can I add to that wish list? Yes. I want a shoe that I can slip on. You're sick of tying your <laughs> shoes. Is that what you're saying? I'm that's just, just, I'm just, just too, much. too busy. I'm just <laughs> too busy. Well, I'll tell you, these Vessi shoes are the best. I love to walk so I can present, I can run through airports, and I have walked miles in mine. Yeah. If you haven't met Vessi yet, imagine shoes that can handle anything from a milk spill to sudden shower to a tropical storm. And I love that they are lightweight and waterproof. These shoes, they are a busy woman's secret weapon. So you need a shoe that can juggle everything that you do all in a day's work. Go to Vessi.com slash Fluster. That's V-E-S-S-I dot com slash Fluster and enter the code Fluster at checkout to receive your 15% discount. Plus, they've got free shipping to a bunch of places and you'll score your new mom life essential with 15% off by going to Vessi.com slash Fluster using the code at checkout. Hey, everybody. This is Robin at Fluster Clocks. When Lynn and I are not having a great time recording our podcast on the weekends, I have a day job. I have a travel magazine for families. So if you're thinking about a 2023 family vacation, don't plan anything without reading our guides to the best Disney hotels, the best way to get a Disney guide for less, and everything you need to know about booking a Disney cruise. 
Lux Recess has been since 2014 the go-to place for parents to read about luxury travel with honest reviews written for parents by parents. Check it out. The links are in the show notes for our best guides to Florida travel for your spring break in 2023. That's LuxRecess.com. L-U-X-C-R-E-C-E-S-S dot com. Okay, we're back. If you read the anxiety audit, that was the way that book was set up, the way that book was structured was what are the patterns that I want people to be aware of? So what are the anxiety patterns? Because people don't generally think about anxiety as being made up of patterns. People don't think about depression as being made up of patterns. Because they're so stuck on the content. Correct. And this is where I am so grateful to my mentors because they really helped me see that this is about patterns and it's about interrupting those patterns and owning those patterns and of course, recognizing those patterns. So we have those patterns that we all do and usually most people have like two to four that they do a lot and maybe not all of them. If you haven't taken inventory personally of what your patterns are. I think that it's a huge disservice for you to even try and help your kids, help your family and change the culture without having a very clear understanding of who you are and what yours are. Which sort of is a good segue into the first pattern that we're talking about, which is really hard to deal with, which is denial, denying your patterns. So somebody who's a denier of what they're doing, a denier of their pattern, a denier of their behavior. When I'm working with a family, the trickiest families to deal with are the ones that don't own their own stuff. Like I was just talking to a woman the other day that I work with, and the thing that is amazing about her or the thing that makes her so delightful to work with is that she totally owns her own patterns. It was almost surprising at the beginning when I was first meeting her because I would say like, I think you're doing this. Or I think you need to change this. And she'd be like, yeah, totally. I totally do that. I was like, oh my God, that's so refreshing. And we were talking about the struggles that she's having in her marriage right now. And one of the struggles is she said, I really work hard at owning my own patterns and my husband is denying his role. And that right away becomes such a roadblock to being able to repair this relationship. When two people can acknowledge and own their own patterns when they come up without being defensive, that changes everything. Right. Because what the denying does is that for one, the other person is trying to say, this is what's going on. And then you're saying, no, I'm not doing that. Or that's not a problem. The example I give a lot is the family that I was working with where one of the kids really was struggling with OCD. And the dad said, and I will remember this forevermore, what's wrong with a neat and tidy house? Right. Other people in the family meeting, like the kids, like threw themselves back onto the couch in despair because they were hearing their dad denying what was so clearly a problem and he was minimizing it. He wasn't taking ownership for it. So it becomes then that what aboutism. So say you're having a conflict and you're not owning your own pattern. And instead you're saying, well, what about the time that you did this? What about the time? And it becomes very quickly there's the blaming, right? Which is very connected to the denying that other pattern of blaming. And it's hard to own your own stuff. We get immediately defensive because it does feel like criticism and it does make us feel vulnerable. But being able to say, that's what I do. You're right. That skill, if it is hard and you feel vulnerable, the more you do it, the easier it gets. Mm -hmm. I had a delightful feeling great love for my husband the other day because he was talking to a relative on the phone that is going through some stuff. And I heard him talking about the patterns that he works on. He was articulating. He didn't care that I was hearing. It wasn't like he was trying to have a private conversation and have my ear up against the door. He was just walking around the house talking. But he was articulating the patterns that he knows that he has to work on. And he was talking to this other person about how he knows where they came from and how it's been really helpful for him to just acknowledge it. And that level of understanding and insight, that didn't happen when you guys were in your 20s. You've worked towards that, and it's a goal to working towards that. Yeah. I mean, we're 40 years in, my husband and I. He was having a conversation 20 years ago. He wouldn't have been talking about those patterns in the way that he's talking about them now. He wouldn't have been acknowledging them. He wouldn't have been owning them and really owning them without shame. That was the other thing too. Like he was very matter of fact about the fact that that's something that he continues to work on. It is such a diffuser of conflict 
And once we diffuse the conflict and once you're owning your own stuff, once you're recognizing your own patterns, once you're saying to your partner or your colleague or your child, yeah, that's something that I'm continuing to work on. I got to own that. Yep. I was doing that thing. It's an enormously connecting experience. You reference a well-known therapist, Terry Real. Yep. In another podcast, you mentioned that maybe you could refresh. So he was talking about being a couples therapist. And he said that one of the standard things that you learn as a couples therapist is that things are 50-50. And he specializes in working with narcissistic, kind of grandiose, very difficult men is one of the things that he's really well known for. And he said, once I stopped trying to make it 50-50, and once I started helping people own their own patterns without trying to make it even, without trying to say, well, there's two sides to every story, he said his work really changed. Because there are some situations where one person's pattern is so incredibly dominant or even abusive or unworkable that trying to get the other person in the couple to be like, yeah, well, you're equally responsible for these patterns, he said it didn't work. And that was actually pretty revolutionary to talk about in couples work. And I've heard other people say that too, like people know Esther Perel. They talk about the fact that it's not always even and that the problem is if somebody's not owning their own pattern, you don't get anywhere. And you got to be able to own your own patterns. And he as a therapist, Terry as a therapist, will call out people who have one of these patterns that's incredibly destructive. So it's just interesting to think about that level of ownership of your stuff and both parties have to really commit to that. Very concretely, how do you do that? Well, one of the things is that in conversations, and maybe you're in couples therapy, or maybe you're talking through this with your partner, to have a discussion about what your patterns are and to ask the other person, like, what are the things that I do? What are the patterns that I have that you think are the most difficult for us to manage? Listen to what your partner is saying and think about it yourself. Because when you start owning them and when you give permission for your partner to call you out and then you say, oh my gosh, you're right, things change because you're losing that defensiveness and you're saying we're working on ourselves, we're identifying our own patterns so that we can have a conversation without this conflict, without this defensiveness, without this whataboutism. It makes things better. My husband is actually really good at calling out a few of those patterns for me in a way that has come to feel very supportive. He says, I recognizing that you're doing this thing. It, when he says it, it has a real supportive flavor to it, not an accusatory, not there's something wrong with you, but look, I think you're stuck in this pattern. I think you need to, to step back and see that you're doing this right now. I think that finding that language, that tone where you're on the same page takes time and takes practice. Because the immediate thing that's going to pop up when somebody calls you out on your pattern or somebody tries to even helpfully say, like, I think you're doing in your pattern, the immediate thing that comes up is that we want to defend ourselves. Exactly. We feel so defensive. Yeah. So if somebody is really rigid and you say, gosh, I think you're just being a little rigid about this. And you know, you tend to be rigid about this. And then they're like, I'm not being rigid. There's the rigidity. And then we're just going to sprinkle the denial on top. Just like that guy when the kids were trying to say, like, Dad, we think your OCD really is having an impact on our family. And he was like, what's wrong with a neat and tidy house? Boom. Everybody was like, forget it. So what do you think is one of the other big patterns that we should all be looking at within our own relationships? Connected to this, and I think I've already mentioned it, and we've talked about this, is blaming. The pattern of blaming, right? So denial and blaming are probably maybe siblings, at the very least, their first cousins. Because when we're denying something, we're looking for another source. We're trying to figure out, it isn't me that's doing this, so I've got to figure out what the other person is doing. The blame pattern is what's preventing you from taking ownership. Right. I will say this, like I've talked about this on the show, because when you started talking about blame in such a toxic way, I was very aware of like, when do I blame? Sometimes it isn't that you need to own your stuff. Sometimes you are blaming other people for things that they do. And then the solution there is, who cares? Let it roll off your back. Decide to not get upset about that or know the difference between what impacts you personally and what you should take personally. 
And so build a wall where when certain people do certain things that annoy you, decide not to be annoyed. Right. Decide it's not about you. It's not a personal affront. One of the things with all of these patterns is that if you can get out of that mindset of they're doing it to me or I have to blame somebody else and just be like, yeah, that's their pattern. They're doing it. People blame for a few reasons. They blame because nobody ever gave them permission to own their own stuff because that's a vulnerable place to be. So if you were in a family where there was a lot of criticism, even a lot of harsh interactions, if you didn't feel, you know, I don't like this word, but it has its place. Like if you didn't feel emotionally safe, I only don't like the word safe when we're talking about setting up safe rooms in schools for anxious kids. So if you didn't feel emotionally safe, then blame is a way to protect yourself from what might be coming your way because you're trying to get out of something. You're trying to not suffer the consequences of owning your own stuff. That's why we deny. That's why we blame. So we know where it comes from. It's an armor that you put on. It's the tennis racket that you hold up to hit back the ball coming at you. In your relationship, you've got to be clear that if you own your own stuff, somebody's not going to come at you. Somebody's not going to shame you. Somebody's not going to demean you. Somebody's actually going to be grateful for the fact that you owned your own stuff. I had a conversation with a friend recently. Very often in a partnership, one person does like things neater. I think this is very, very common. So my friend who was telling me this is more the clean type. And I said, you have a pattern of wanting things to be a certain way. You have to own that because you do have that pattern. So when someone is violating the way you want it to be, it's creating a lot of big emotions. You're taking it personally. Tell me a little bit more what you think about that. Well, I think it's about taking it personally. If we use a, an analogy, say somebody decides that they're going to be vegan and somebody else is going to eat animal products. If you are vegan and you see the person choosing to eat animal products as a personal insult to you, rather than they have a different way of looking at the world, they have a different way of viewing things, that's not going to work out so well. If you like your house perfect and the person you live with doesn't, and you take their approach to living in a house as a personal affront, as an insult to you, as if they are doing it on purpose, rather than you looking at your own pattern and saying, this is my preference, but it's not everybody's preference, you're going to have a lot of conflict. Unless the way that you want to do things is really sort of destructive and could use the analogy of like, I don't drink. And so somebody else might say like, well, I really like to drink and their pattern is destructive that they're actually drinking alcoholically. I'm not going to say like, yeah, so don't take it personally. It's hard not to when that pattern is so invasive. But if we're looking at preferences, if we're looking at what time somebody likes to go to bed versus what time somebody likes to wake up in the morning, if you take it personally, if you see their difference as a personal attack on you, rather than something that the two of you can negotiate because you have different preferences, it's going to cause a lot of conflict. Again, I mean, I bring up Michael all the time, but this is Michael Yapko's work about discrimination strategies, is that say you have somebody who really likes the house to be perfect and somebody else who doesn't care about it, you've got to come up with a way to coexist, that you respect each other's perspective, but there's going to be times when you want the house to be more perfect than other times, and there's going to be times when clutter and some messiness is totally fine. So an example might be that say you got married and you didn't have kids, and your house was neat as a pin. I'm just going to use heteronormative things like it's a male, female couple. And let's say that the husband was the one that liked the house to be neat as a pin, and you're both working full time. Then you have twins, and now they're 18 months old. And it's impossible to keep the house neat as a pin because now you've got two little babies running around. And the person who wants the house to be perfect constantly sees the person trying to manage the twins as insulting his preferences. How dare you don't listen? How dare you don't keep this house perfect because you know that's what I want? Rather than saying, you know what? It was great when we were just the two of us. 
how are we going to manage this because our life has changed or our situation has changed? And that's flexibility. If it became this blame thing of like, how dare you not keep the house the way that I want it? I'm blaming you for that rather than maybe this husband owning like, oh God, I know I've always been a little bit crazy about keeping the house perfect. And so I own that that irritates me because now we've got these two little kids and it's hard to pull off. So I'm working on that. Imagine the difference in the conversations in that couple that are going to happen about the fact that they are knee deep in the clutter that comes with toddlers. Yep. That's beautiful. Well, we'll take a break and we'll come back and discuss the third pattern. Okay, so now back to the show. Okay, pattern number three. This is what I talk about all of the time. The difference between emotional management and emotional reactivity. If you have a pattern of emotional reactivity and you can't own that and you don't recognize that, if you justify it, if you think that your explosive anger is really necessary in your relationships, in your family, in your marriage, you're going to have some problems. Is it just anger or is it other big emotions too, I would think? Yeah, I think it's other big emotions too, but anger is the one that sort of gets the most attention, but it can be catastrophic reactions. So somebody is consistently overestimating the problem and going into that catastrophic place. So life is one crisis after another, not being able to manage disappointment or frustration that doesn't turn into anger. So it could be somebody whose emotional reactivity or lack of emotional management comes across as being sulky and sort of being grumpy and kind of spreading that gloom everywhere and feeling very entitled to that rather than working through the problem or trying to figure out how to own that, feeling really justified in that big emotional reaction that sort of becomes pervasive in the relationship and in the household, for sure. We talk about emotional literacy all the time, being able to recognize what you're feeling and own those feelings. I was talking to a young client of mine, a young woman who is delightful, and she had decided recently to end a relationship of several months because the person that she was dating wasn't able to articulate what was going on with him emotionally, and he would go into the silent treatment. He would isolate? He would isolate, and but even if she said like, hey, what's going on? He would say, Nothing. And she would say, well, it doesn't look like nothing and you're not talking to me. And he would, you know, this was deny, deny too. So he would shut down. If she would try and figure out what was going on and ask some questions and he would get frustrated and angry with her, but he didn't have the ability to manage his emotions or even articulate what was going on with him emotionally. She tried. I mean, it wasn't like it happened once and she decided to call it quits. This was a guy who was really not good at managing his emotions and talking about them and owning them. And that became just something that she wasn't going to be able to tolerate. Do you remember Edie Brickell? Yeah, of course. So Edie Brickell's her first album, Shooting Rubber Bands at the Stars, for listeners of a certain age, that was such a big album. There was a song on it called Nothing. And it was about being in a relationship with someone where the response was nothing. There's nothing I hate more than nothing. Nothing keeps me up at night. And it's talking about being with someone who's not emotionally articulate. Yeah. Whenever you say Edie Brickell, the only thing I can think of is that Edie and I stood next to each other and waited while our husbands peed <laughs> in the <laughs> urinal. Where was the urinal? It was somewhere in New York City. I can't remember. Uh-huh. When I tell this story, I often say, because I've never used a urinal, but I will often say like, my husband and Paul Simon stood side by side and peed in the same urinal, to which my husband has corrected me and said, you generally don't share a urinal. Yeah, but they were in side by side urinals, just so you know. I'm not going to out this celebrity because this was a very embarrassing thing he did, but this reminded me of my celebrity urinal story is that I was at a fancy hotel in New York. I was at the St. Regis in New York and I was coming out of the bathroom and there you go up the stairs back into the lobby and a, a very favorite, well-known celebrity was drunk as a skunk at the top of the stairs and he was pantomiming that he was urinating down the stairs. <laughs> 
I came out of the bathroom and his wife came out of the bathroom at the same time and she was mortified. And I was like, this isn't what I thought he would be like. Was it Tom Hanks? <laughs> no, it was, <laughs> it was someone way older than Tom Hanks. Well, that's very nice of you not to out him. Yeah, I don't know. That just doesn't feel right. But Paul and my husband, as far as I know, were just peeing very appropriately. And Edie and I were just standing. (laughs) I don't think I knew who she was as I was standing there until Paul Simon came out of the bathroom. And then I made the connection, but I don't think I recognized her. Anyway, how did we get off on this tangent? Oh, because you were talking about nothing. Yeah, nothing keeps me up at night. That is a great lyric. Nothing keeps me up at night. Yeah. If we had the rights, I'd love to end the show with the song, but we don't. So I'll put a link in the show notes for those of you who don't remember. Okay. Yeah. Emotional reactivity. And we might even call it like there's emotional reactivity and then emotional disconnection are probably also things that hang out together. Well, you did a whole episode early in Fluster Cluck, season one where you were really talking about emotional vomiting, almost like really kind of freaking out in front of the family with anger, with all of these emotions. And it was a great episode really of, okay, it's going to happen. No one's perfect. And then what do you do after? Yeah. And so let me give you the advanced version of that too, because I don't remember that episode because I don't remember what I've talked about. I mean, I'm sure I did it, but I probably talked about repair So how do you repair? So you emotionally vomit on somebody and then how do you repair? So now that maybe you freaked out or you got really anxious and then you go back to your kids and you say, I'm really sorry or this or that. Let me just give you now the advanced message about that. You can't keep doing that even if you apologize afterwards. You can't keep exploding. You can't keep getting catastrophic. You can't keep freaking out then apologize and expect that that is going to wipe the slate clean every time. And if you are doing that, if you are being emotionally reactive and then apologizing and you're doing it over and over and over again, you are in denial of the impact of that emotionally reactive pattern. I mean, just to make sure I hear what you're saying, because I feel like you're being very like judicious in this. But if you are a parent, for example, who yells and freaks out a lot, Owning it and apologizing afterwards is not enough because if this pattern happens enough, it is essential that you work on the pattern so you don't do it, period. Correct. Exactly. Yeah. You were just saying that really nicely. (laughs) Yeah. If you keep exploding or you keep freaking out, I'll use another analogy, right? Maybe you cheat on your spouse and you decide that you're going to own it and you're going to work on your marriage, if you do it seven more times, I'm pretty sure that after like the fourth time, the apology is not going to cut it. Probably even after the second time. You've got to own the pattern. So the apology, the owning of it is a really great place to start, but it's not enough. You've got to work on changing the pattern. So first you acknowledge it, you recognize it, you apologize when it happens. That's where you start. But then the next step is you've got to change the pattern. You can't just keep doing it over and over again and expect that everybody's going to be okay with that. That's really corrosive to relationships. Yeah, I think it's a big deal for kids to have parents who sort of explode. I think that was probably one of my late mother's vulnerabilities is that she was a people pleaser. So she was very perky, very happy, very chipper until all of a sudden she hit her limit and wasn't and she would explode. The dream I had so much growing up was this dream of a tidal wave. Mm. As an adult, I realize it was that overwhelming flooding of emotion I was witness to. Mm -hmm. That you couldn't get out of the way of. I couldn't get it out of the way of, and I didn't really know it was coming. Your mom isn't here anymore for us to talk about it with her, for you to talk about it with her, but wouldn't have been interesting if she ultimately owned that pattern of being a people pleaser, how difficult it was to manage that and how she would reach your breaking point and then work on not being a people pleaser, because that's another pattern. Despite the fact that I say this stuff about my mom, she and I were besties. We were super duper close and we had a really authentic connection. But she wasn't perfect and nor was I. The relationship still lives on. I still think about her as I continue to age and I look back and think about it. And I think that for my friends who haven't 
lost family, I think that that is a nice part of it is that I love the fact that my mom died, I don't know, like 11 or 12 years ago, but our relationship has continued and hasn't stopped. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is a nice way to put it. And a lot of people who talk about grief, that's what they talk about. I've mentioned in the past that podcast that Julia Louis-Dreyfus did, Wiser Than Me, where she talked to older women. She talked to Carol Burnett. She talked to Jane Fonda. And one of the things she said that was interesting in that podcast is that she and her mom went into therapy together when she was 62 and her mom was in her 80s. They decided that they were going to work through their shit. She said it was pretty amazing. I thought, how many people do that, right? Go into therapy at that stage of life. It was really cool. I recommend that podcast. It was very interesting. If you're a listener because your family has a really anxious child or teen where the anxiety is really affecting your whole life of a family. These couples things are like the building blocks, right? Yeah. And I'll tell you, I get a lot of emails from people that I don't think have thought about it in this way, that they're really emailing me and they're looking for help with their child. It really sometimes is sort of a real sort of like moment of like, what? When I say really important for you to look at the patterns in your family that have kept this going and how long it's been going on, right? Because lots of times they're like, well, she's 17 and I know she's been anxious for a really long time and now we want her to go to college. And so what do we do to fix her? And then when I say, all the stuff I say, a lot of times people are like, oh my gosh. Yeah. But it's pretty fruitful work, I think. And if you're working with a 17-year-old who's really anxious, they appreciate parents. They appreciate you owning your own patterns. That is a really great gift that you can give to your teenager, for sure. Yeah, they have a BS detector. They sure do. The age that that comes in, it's really good to honor it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it is really good to honor it. Okay, so ever since you brought up the celebrity standing at the top of the staircase at the St. Regis, I've just been going through all the possible celebrities that it could be. As soon as we end this, as soon as we stop this recording, you are going to tell me who it is because I have to know. Deal. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for listening. And if you found this podcast helpful, please give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It helps other people find this information. And if you'd like to dig deeper on any of these topics, we have specialized playlists on our Spotify profile and the link is in the show notes. Topics like teens, depression, and OCD. Bye, Lynn. Bye, Robin. Hey, are you a parent of a teenager? Are you feeling overwhelmed about how to be what they need while also holding limits and boundaries that keep them safe? Are you tired of conversations that negate how messy this season of parenting is? Well, I've got you. My name is Casey O'Rourke. I am a positive discipline trainer, parent coach, and the host of the Joyful Courage podcast. Every week I come to you with an interview, digging into tough topics with experts I trust and solo shows that go deep into the personal growth and mindset needed to raise teens in a way that grows them into confident, capable young people. I am not afraid of getting real about the intersection of conscious parenting and the teen years, while also bringing in vulnerability, humor, and lightness. I'm walking the path with you and honored to serve. Listen to Joyful Courage on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you consume podcasts.